and I, I'm delighted to be here. Um, kind of surprised to be here. I, I wouldn't have thought last year at this time we'd be talking to anyone about a flood. Um, but uh, you probably didn't think you'd be at a workshop on a flood either. So um, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm here to give you just a few notes and remarks on some of the uh, scientific observations uh, that we made in the flood. It was a bit of a surprise before, as was uh, as was for, for many people to see this uh, sort of rapid destruction and change. And the uh, uh, the Center for Hydrology at the University of Saskatchewan has a small research base in the Kananaskis Valley. Uh, we have a building on the grounds of the University of Calgary Biogeoscience Institute that we call the Coldwater Lab. And nearby is our Marmot Creek Research Basin. I say ours, but it's really it's been many peoples over the years, it still is many peoples. It was started by the federal government and the provincial governments with tremendous insight in the early 1960s and carried on some form of measurements for over 50 years, at times very intensively, at other times it's been a little quiet. But, the, uh, but we had lots of instruments in there in June of last year and so it was a, uh, not only a disaster but a scientific learning experience for us and uh, I, I want to relate some of that to you. It was also uh, and because you can't measure everything, even in an instrumented watershed, I'll be showing you some modeling results. So uh, to start with, the model I'll uh, talk about, uh, just give a briefest introduction, is uh, it's not really a model, it's a platform for assembling models. We call it the Cold Regions Hydrological Modeling Platform. And you can use this to create purpose-built models for the uh, task uh, that you have. We developed this uh, initially at Environment Canada and then the University of Saskatchewan in starting in the late 1990s because of our frustration with importing models from temperate zones into the prairies and the cold regions of Canada and seeing them fail one after another, uh, whether they were uh, fancy American models or very sophisticated European models. It didn't matter. They didn't have energy balance snow melt. They didn't have frozen soil infiltration. They didn't have wind transport of snow. They didn't have a good representation of snow interception in canopies or subcanopy canopy snow melt. Uh, they didn't deal with slope and aspect in the mountains, uh, phase change between rainfall and snowfall appropriately, or link in a realistic way through hill slope hydrology to groundwater. So we wanted to uh, develop our own system for that. We can make it very, very complex where we have lots of information and good data to run it with and lots of parameters. And we can make it much more simple in areas where we have less information on the watershed and uh, we want a simpler representation of hydrology. So I won't go into it too much, but it's very flexible and we've been using it in ungauged basins and gauge basins in uh, the prairies, northern Canada, the mountains. It's been used re recently in Patagonia um, in uh, the, the Tibetan Plateau in China and uh, various areas in Western Europe. So Marmot Creek is a tiny, tiny part of the Rockies. Uh, it's under 10 square kilometers. It's, uh, if you know the Nikiska ski area where the uh, downhill Olympics were in the 1988, that's, it's right next to that, but it predates that. It was initially established to look at the effect of uh, forest management practices on stream flow. And so it has some interesting features. It has some old clear cuts in there. It has some small clearings in it. It has different slopes and aspects. It has a big alpine zone. It has things like high elevation groundwater wells, which you don't find anywhere else in the Rockies. And uh, lots and lots of met stations. So it's a good place to do some work. You see from the land cover, the, um, the large alpine zone in here. This is actually where the high precip occurs and a lot of the runoff is generated and then an uh, uh, area of small clearings in Twin Creek, a controlled middle creek with typical montane forest, and some big clear cuts in Cabin Creek, moving down to the confluence there. And uh, give you a little quick tour of it. It's a pretty place as well. If you like to go hiking, Centennial Ridge Trail goes right through it. Some other trails as well, Skogan Pass. There's a couple bears here and there, a few cougars, but that's the way it goes. The, uh, you see it's very windswept. This is Fisera Ridge and the north face, the wind actually whips around through here, scours the north face and dumps really deep snow on the south face in here where we can get three, four meters of snow in the springtime and that's something I'll talk about a bit. And there's Mount Allen at the back of it and uh, sometimes we get a lot of snow in there. That's a precip gauge I'll show you later on uh, getting buried by very deep snow. Further down the mountain, some steep slopes uh, covered with uh, spruce, fir, pine. Uh, some big clearings in there, and uh, and then the model. So how do we model that? Well, uh, 
a full description is in a journal called Hydrology and Earth System Sciences from 2010, uh, where we describe it, a paper by uh, Jing Fang and myself and others. But the, uh, it's a modular system. So we have modules that deal with the observations, calculate the radiation, which we use for evapotranspiration, stoma calculations. We blow the snow around, we melt it, we infiltrate it into frozen and unfrozen soils, we evaporate it, we run it down hill slopes, and then we route it out using Muskingum type routing. So that's the model in a nutshell. It was broken up into uh, several dozen uh, landscape units over the uh, sub-basins of Marmot Creek. Uh, there's a fairly detailed representation of hill slopes in here. You can see where we're looking at uh, variable contributing areas as, as we approach the valley bottoms and uh, connections between groundwater and shallow surface water. We also recognize the importance of macropores of large cracks in the mountains for moving water quickly at times. And we're putting in a new representation of uh, soil freezing to allow for a perched water table as the soil thaws. It's not quite functional yet, but that's what we've been working on this winter. We've run it uh, without that feature um, with an, an uncalibrated mode over Marmot Creek for the years that we have strong data, which starts in 2005, uh, starts then because uh, we couldn't get our instruments up in the flood that occurred that year. It was so wet. We tried to put them up in the spring with moderate success. So, uh, and uh, for that, it uh, you see in, in red are the uh, observations. We have the basin sub-gauge. These are very, very small sub-basins, Cabin Creek, Middle Creek, Twin Creek. And, at Marmot, and, and so it's doing okay in there, but at Marmot Creek it's doing reasonably well in terms of capturing the hydrograph. And then here's the, uh, uh, the actual uh, model for 2013. We don't have an observation uh, in there yet uh, for reasons I'll explain. But it's, uh, all I'm saying from this is that it's a tool we think we can use in there, and because it's physically based and not calibrated, we think we can take it to extreme conditions, which is exactly what June of 2013 presented. So what can we say about the flood of June 2013? By the way, that's our, uh, the GNR with Alta Shield that was partly buried before to give you some idea of the deep snows we get up in the upper parts of Marmot Creek. Uh, this map is from Alberta Environment. You've probably seen it before, and I bet you'll see it again before the end of the workshop, uh, interpolating amongst the uh, uh, precip measurements. And you can see there's a bit of a bullseye in the Kananaskis Valley. It's very close to Marmot Creek. Fairly large area that had over 200 and 50 millimeters of, uh, of precip. In fact, there was an area at uh, further south of our site which had 350 millimeters of precip. And there were some interesting features to this. Uh, in Canmore and other places, we didn't notice thunder and lightning during the storm, which means a lack of convective activity, which is very, very interesting because severe storms in the spring in uh, Alberta generally have some strong convection to them. That uh, suggests that the Precip mechanisms may not have been uh, may not have been fully uh, the typical temperate zone snowfall which melts and forms rain that we get from convection. Uh, it may have had some tropical storm genesis to us, which may have led to some of the uh, very strong rainfall. At least that's a suggestion that uh, Dr. Roy Rasmussen of uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado is suggesting, and the Colorado floods of last September were also called also tropical storms in their genesis, which is an interesting thing for us to start looking at. Um, this is the uh, Kappa reanalysis from Environment Canada. It's a Canadian pre precipitation reanalysis. It uses the GEM numerical weather prediction model. Uh, uh, basically, uh, does a reanalysis of that to come up with the precip amounts. They're showing a peak of 230 millimeters. It's a bit under, but the basic spatial pattern is not too bad uh, compared to uh, what was measured. Now, what do we measure in Marmot Creek? Well, Marmot Creek, we have precip gauges at different elevations. And the uh, short story is that we measured about the same amount of precip, the same depth of precipitation from the valley bottom right up to the mountain top. That's weird. Um, you remember your hydrology, everyone talks about orographic increases in precipitation. Didn't happen, not a whiff of it uh, for this storm from our measurements. Any differences you see there are due to measurement errors. So what was going on? Well, the tropical genesis of the storm could be part of the problem. It could also have been tremendous lifting before it actually hit this part of the mountains, and so the, uh, uh, the lifting had already occurred. It's an interesting uh, thing, though, because the, if we had only had a valley bottom station, uh, 
and taken a typical uh, precip gradient with elevation, we would have grossly overestimated the precip of the mountaintops. It didn't happen. The, uh, the other thing is that the last days of the storm, it turned to snow. You see the snowpack that formed in the upper part of Marmot Creek, um, uh, and it started forming uh, later on the 21st of June. And so that transition to snow was an important part of the flood. It probably helped us out a bit because we had a snowpack build up instead of further runoff. What about the rainfall rates? Well, you know, you can get in convective storms over the prairies in excess of 25 millimeters an hour very easily, sometimes higher. Uh, the maximum rate we measured was just up over 12 millimeters per hour. Most of the rates were below that in the 8 millimeter per hour or less. That's not spectacular. It's, it's heavy rain and you see it's very, very steady rain through here. But this is not the heaviest rain anyone's ever seen by, by far. So, uh, so I think what was more interesting about it was the volume of, of precip which came down and the, uh, there's only one short break that we measured at Marmot Creek and otherwise it was fairly steady for several days and uh, so that was the key feature there. And snow, it had been colder than normal May and June and so the snowpack hadn't been above normal, it was a fairly typical snowpack close to average in that region but the uh, snow is hanging on quite late in the year. And so this is Facera Ridge, our south facing station, and that's how it looks in late June. You can often get a, a snowpack line there. And uh, we had snow surveys just before the storm, uh, looking at the, uh, um, looking at the uh, water equivalent and the snow cover in the south face before and after. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the uh, water equivalent change, you can see that we're going from, uh, we're losing over 100 millimeters water equivalent on the south face, a bit less on the north face because it's not completely snow covered. And that south face is going from almost complete snow coverage to half snow coverage uh, over that period of time. But what are the details? Well, we have a station there, and one thing you find out is that ultrasonic snow depth gauges don't work in heavy rain. So the gap in the blue line is when the SR50 doesn't work. Uh, that's an unfortunate feature of that device. Uh, but you see it was fairly warm at the start of the rain, at the start of the precip, 6-7 degrees even in the high mountains and then dropping off turning to snow towards the end of it and uh, we had a significant decline in snowpack with a bit of an increase afterwards and then subsequent melt. So this is a rain on snow event at high elevations and the, the thing is that the, we have inadequate observations directly here to characterize that too much so I have to get into a bit of modeling. But that's a feature, and if we try to figure out how much rain on snow melt occurred during the storm, the lowest estimate I would say is 71 millimeters. Uh, the highest estimate is over 200. I suspect it's, it's just over 100 millimeters in the alpine zone in general for rain on snow contribution, which is still significant when we had 250 millimeters on the basin. So it's taken it up uh, almost another third. The other thing is, um, in the abstract, I've got an error. I talked about being wetter than normal, and it was certainly colder than normal, but it wasn't all that wet. And if we look at our soil moisture measurements in the clear cut, things started drying out just after June 10th. Remember, it was a lovely weekend around Father's Day. I remember it when we went camping at, uh, in the Kananaskis. It was, it was beautiful. And things started drying out those last few days before the storm hit. That was important because here's a storm coming in here, and now you can see this wetting up of the soils back to saturation. That took several hours, in some cases almost a day, and that took a lot of the edge off the runoff generation in the mountains. And uh, it's important to know. This is in a clear cut, which is wetter than the forest around it. And so the forest would have, would have had even greater water holding capacity for this storm event. Okay, so there's Marmot Creek. Quite often you can jump over it. And you see here, you wouldn't want to jump across that. It's a, uh, it's a real mess. Uh, tremendous sediment transport, uh, debris transport in Marmot. You see it's muddy brown. It's uh, actually, in some cases, carrying trees. It's carrying boulders. It's doing lots of erosion. There is a, a debris slide in the upper mountains that fed into it. And then you see it's rushing down through the forest. So any routing of that is going to be very, very challenging. And. Uh, here it is a few days later near what had been the water survey at Canada Gauge. And, uh, anyway. So that gauge had a bad time. Uh, here's the uh, Marmot Creek V-Notch Weir. It's in a textbook by Bruce and Clark, 1965. 
the pride of the Water Survey of Canada. Here it is in July 2013. So we have some doubts on the rating curve in there, and uh, you should too. Um, and uh, here, here's what the water survey gauge looked like beforehand, a little sediment trap to catch any uh, rocks that might come and disturb the V-notch weir. And then that's where I was standing is now underwater. The stream has moved over to the side, and, um, and that's what we have. And when we look at the stage measurements for that year, there's this awful blip, and that's kind of the death throes of the gauge, and then it's probably meaningless. So water survey is going through a valiant effort to try to reconstruct what's occurring there. I'm not going to present any measurements yet. We simply don't know. So uh, the last refuge of the scoundrel is modeling, and that's what you'll see from the rest of this talk. So we decided, well, what could we do? We, we, have a, we can set up the model, crim model, for this basin. We can model the flood. We don't know if it's right. So we'll do more modeling. And uh, we thought it would be interesting to take that week of crazy meteorology and throw it into different years at the same time. 2006 up to 2012 and see what would have happened in other years. And then we thought it would also be interesting to take that week and move it to early May, uh, late May, early June, uh, early July and late July in a fairly dry year, 2009, to see what was happening. At first we did it for 2013, but when you put the flood the week after the flood, you get a bigger flood. So that's not so interesting. So 2009 didn't have a flood, so we can do it every year through there and get the same thing. And this is kind of interesting. So the blue line is throwing the flood on top of the actual meter, uh, hydrology of what occurred in Marmot Creek. And see 2006, there was going to be a little peak and we took it up to over two cubic meters per second. Um, 2000, 2008, there have been three peaks and the third peak was enhanced substantially by the flood. Same thing in 2007. 2009, the peak was already over and then the flood peak was thrown on top of that not quite so effective. And so you get, uh, uh, clearly timing is a big issue with this, but also the, uh, the fact that this flood was a little bit late uh, meant that its peak was not on top of the normal peaks for the streams. In many cases, it was already moving into recession. Not always. Um, here we're carrying on 2010, sort of right on the peak there. 2012, big peak. And 2011, it's right on top of an already rapid uh, peak, so that's pretty good. And this is what we had in 2013. 2013 is not spectacular. That was not the biggest year at all uh, for this in terms of the meteorology, in terms of flood generation. And in fact, if we look at the last eight years, uh, put stars over 2013, uh, here's the discharge over the uh, uh, two weeks around that period. We see it's actually one of the least productive years for that flood to have occurred. And it was a little bit wetter than normal, not spectacularly so, and a little bit colder than normal, but not spectacularly so. But it was the timing, and so we had to go into the bit of the hydrology and understand why this was not a productive flood. We actually, believe it or not, we dodged the bullet a little bit with having it at this timing in 2013. Uh, strange as that may sound, it could have been worse. So the other thing we looked at was different times of the year. What if it were earlier or later? And I chose 2009 because it was a dry dryish year, low flow year, similar to 2013, and put it into the red line early May, late May, uh, early June. Black is the actual time it did occur, uh, then um, uh, early July and late July. And for the alpine f zone flow generation, no big deal. For the tree line area, the later it comes, the bigger the flood that is generated out of there. And uh, for the upper forest, not so much. But these clear cuts, again, the earlier it comes, the more active the clear cuts are. So these clear cuts can be early, in, if it occurs in May, these clear cuts can be hot spots for flow generation. If it occurs in, in uh, July, then the tree line, above tree line area, is a hot spot for flow generation. Why? It's because of the snowpack. The uh, rain on snow contribution, you see the big drifts are around that tree line. That's where the buried gauges were. That's where a lot of this flood generation can occur if it comes late enough. And, the, um, and there's soil moisture differences in there associated with late line snow. If we look at the various watersheds, again, we see black is what, when it actually did occur, but thrown into 2009, that if it had come earlier, uh, the uh, uh, flood discharge could have been much, much larger over that period of time. So again, uh, given the fact it was in late June, we dodged the bullet a little bit. It could have been worse. But what's also important to recognize, if that precip had occurred in May, it probably would not have fallen as warm rain on the alpine zone. So it would have taken exceptionally warm conditions for that to occur as well. 
But when you hear Paul Whitfield's talk later on, perhaps those warmer conditions are in the future. So go to a few conclusions. Uh, Roughly 250 millimeters of precip. Most of it was rain with a little bit of snow at the end. It was spatially extensive. That was interesting. There was not a discernible orographic effect at our research site. That was amazing. The uh, evidence of convection was very limited except for some uh, uh, lightning activity near Burns Creek. And that's the one spot where uh, there was 350 millimeters of precip measured. So where there was convection further south in the Kananaskis, that's where things got pretty wild. It was not particularly intensive, and, but it was of long duration. Um, there are rain on snow contributions on the order of 100 millimeters at high elevation, which uh, certainly would have contributed more to the flow because they're occurring over parts of the basin that have frozen soils or very wet, shallow soils and very steep gradients. And so they're very effective in runoff generation. Uh, the virtual flood generations we've shown you um, is just modeling, but it suggests that the flood generation efficiency was relatively low in 2013 compared to some of the previous years since 2005. And uh, what is interesting, that we found uh, runoff generation hotspots that are associated with the tree line location. If the tree line shifts, that could change the hydrology of our basins. And uh, it can shift due to burning disease or climate change. And then the clear cuts are also hotspots of flood generation if the flood occurs earlier in the year. And of course, clear cuts are generally our, our own uh, device. Finally, uh, the suggestion that late June is a relatively inefficient time of the year for flood generation, we're almost fortunate in a way that that's often when our heavy precip events occur, but by then uh, these uh, mountain watersheds are already beginning to dry out a little bit, and so the runoff generation is not quite as effective. So that uh, if it occurred in May, it would have been worse, and in terms of our flood preparedness in the future, we should be worried about warm rainfall events occurring in May. Uh, when that snowpack is uh, still more extensive and soils are a bit wetter. I want to acknowledge all kinds of help from all kinds of groups in Saskatchewan and Alberta federally and uh, and then finally uh, just just say that uh, before we go to Paul Whitfield later on that uh, the book on predicting in ungauged basins is now out is through CWRA it's a wonderful hosting it's on the website it's being sold I understand and uh, also that the principles that we talk about in the book can actually work because uh, flooding is one of the great ungauged events. Uh, the first thing you lose is your stream gauge. So anyway, thank you.